Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today we're going to be going over uh, Game 3 of the World Championship match between uh, Ian Nepomuche and Magnus Carlsen. And if you like content like this and want to see more of it, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So Game 3 of the World Championship match saw Ian Nepomuche having the white pieces. And of course he repeated um, the Roy Lopez. And of course Magnus Carlsen repeated his uh, threatening to play the martial attack. And of course, the martial attack itself, if if you allow it, is, is such a devastating weapon these days in terms of just creating draws in chess. And if you're not familiar with the theory of the martial, I'll just I'll just go over briefly why everybody's avoiding it, because maybe you think this is just kind of a mystery. Why is everybody avoiding the martial so badly? I mean, of course, um, on the lower levels, maybe this is a pawn you can take and you can keep. But this is basically the reason. Um, after c3, d5, takes, takes, if we grab this pawn, um, black's play comes kind of hard and fast. Now, this is the new move. Uh, Marshall himself actually played knight of six. This was found to be um, insufficient in the first time the Marshall was ever played against uh, Capablanca, but then later people started playing this move c6. And basically the idea is is almost brain dead. The, the idea is to just come after uh, the king with queen h4 and do this kind of uh, double attack here. We're going to be attacking the h2 square, forcing the push pawn to g3, and then we're going to play the move queen h3. This makes the light squares around the king surprisingly weak. Now, this isn't enough for white to lose. Uh, white is in time to cover these light squares. However, there were a lot of games that were basically just ending with uh, bishop e3, we'll say bishop g4, and of course this is a big threat, we're threatening bishop f3. We would have to play queen d3 to cover, um, we're threatening to play queen back to d1, and then black would simply play uh, something really easy like rook e8, uh, knight on b to d2, and then there were kind of two moves here. There was f5, there was rook e6, and I think it's even also possible to just immediately play queen h5 with um, black's next idea. But let's just say, for example, rook, a, rook e6, a4. There were a lot of games that were ending after queen h5, and then say a takes b5, a takes b5, uh, queen f1. Black would simply repeat moves with bishop to h3, queen e2, bishop g4, queen d3, bishop f5, and we just have this repetition. And what's annoying about this for white is white is so disorganized and, and black has such a ability to attack these light squares with all the pieces he has coming in to attack. In the handful of situations where white tried to avoid this perpetual, like if back here, for example, white played bishop d1, uh, these these actually ended kind of badly. Um, there was a game that Kramnik was in where after uh, bishop d1, he ended up uh, getting actually a major advantage with with black, and he ended up he ended up up a pawn in the end game, and then he ended up winning that end game. So it's uh, that's why people avoid it. It's just this powerful drawing weapon uh, that we seemingly have uh, nothing against. Um, nobody has been able to find a way around um, just that perpetual, or perhaps landing yourself in an even worse position for white, perhaps just being actually slightly worse. So that's why on the Grandmaster level today, and actually for quite a while, even with the help of modern engines, people have been avoiding the Marshall, and basically all anybody's been focusing on is anti-Marshall systems. So in the last game, um, we saw Ian Napomniche essay the anti-Marshall system H3, and in this game, uh, we saw him essay the anti-martial system h4. So it appears that he played a4 because he wanted to avoid what happened in the first game, which is reasonable because the first game honestly looked like slight edge black, and uh, who wants to repeat that? If he doesn't have an improvement on what Magnus did, or if he doesn't have time to come up with an improvement um, given the time constraints of a match, why not just switch to something else that he's already got fully prepared? So. He started playing a4, and uh, Magnus played uh, basically what amounts to the main line. He just plays bishop b7, and then we had uh, d3, and I mean, the rest of this game, uh, I'm going to have a really difficult time commenting on this, because all of these moves in this game are so ridiculously accurate. I mean, the best I can do is just kind of explain what's going on. I can't really offer that many alternatives in terms of moves. I mean, these players, both of these guys really showed their level in this game. They just showed how good they both were. Um, and just finding um, really this probably the most accurate game of chess ever played 
is game three of this match. Um, in terms of if you run this through an engine, um, the engine is just going to shoot back all these moves pretty much as their top pick. So we have d3, we have d6, uh, knight on b to d2. So, I mean, white's just doing standard. Rillup has planned just developing. Uh, black is doing the same, just playing natural moves. Uh, rook e8, again, very natural, just putting your rook in the middle of the board. It also prepares at some point to play, um, you know, h6, uh, bishop f8. These are kind of typical things, and that's going to be preparing to meet something like c3 and d4, where when you take, the rook will be on the open e-file. All these ideas are really standard fare. Um, it's just normal, normal, normal. So knight f1, this is normal repositioning of white's knight in the Ray Lopez. Uh, white usually intends something like knight f1, knight either g3 or e3, and then c3 followed by d4 is going to be the typical Ray Lopez plan for white. So then we have h6, Magnus following through, uh, bishop d2, just finishing the development, connecting the queen to the rook, um, just putting the bishop on a square, not really caring about which square, but also keeping an eye on the a5 square, preventing knight a5, preventing knight b4. So we have bishop f8, we have knight going to e3, so he chose the e3 square, it's um, eyeballing um, the f5 square, and then of course the one interesting thing about knight e3 and what I expected um, in the game was it does actually prepare g4, which is another typical Roy Lopez plan. A lot of times white will play g4 after h3, but in this case, g4 is even perhaps more appealing because we can play g4 and maybe follow it up very aggressively with h4. Um, and the computer doesn't hate it, so I was kind of expecting something very aggressive like this from Ian Nepomniche. But he plays another move that's objectively just as good or possibly better. Uh, he plays c4, which is uh, the computer's top pick anyway. And it basically just defines the center of the board. It it doesn't give uh, black a whole lot of options. Like he can't push, so he's gonna have to make some sort of exchange here. It's gonna define the middle and it's gonna allow white to take a, a predominance of pawns in the center with d4 and just have that traditional Royal Lopez advantage of just basically having a slightly better center uh, in the middle of the board. So he played c4, but I mean, g4 is an interesting, uh, would have been an interesting idea just going for broke on the king side with like g4, h4, g5. And I think this would have been more Nepomniche's style. Um, if you look at Nepomniche's games, this is more in the spirit of how Ian Nepomniche tends to play chess. Um, just he, he's he got a stable position and he, and he finds a way to create um, very um, aggressive attacking chances. So c4 is good though. c4 is very good. It goes after the center, doesn't weaken his king. So c4, we have b takes c4, knight takes c4, knight c6. Um, again, super solid move for Magnus, just controlling the d4 square. Uh, we have rook c1, a5, again, super solid, just etching out the b4 square so the knight has a place to go. Bishop c3, and then he retreats the bishop, bishop c8. So this is a move that's going to look odd to a lot of amateurs, like are we, we're undeveloping our bishop. Yeah, but um, the... This is not, b7 is not where the bishop wanted to be. Um, we call this biting on granite. Whenever you have a bishop on a diagonal and you're hitting a pawn that's just really well defended, we call that biting on granite. And whenever we're biting on granite, we would like to, whenever we get a chance, whenever it's safe, redeploy that bishop to a more useful diagonal. So bishop c8 followed by something like bishop e6. Now, a lot of times in the Royal Lopez, um, this knight on c6 is misplaced. Of course, that's one of the reasons you saw Magnus pull that knight back earlier. And uh, it, it usually belongs somewhere else. But in this case, as you can see, we have two nice, beautiful, weak squares that that knight can go to. So the knight on c6 is perfectly placed in this case. But if you're ever watching a Ray Lopez game and you're wondering why are people making all these different weird knight maneuvers, a lot of times it just has to do with the pawn structure on the board. Um, the bishop on b7 is biting on granite, so it wants to redeploy c8 to e6. And oftentimes in the Ray Lopez, knights will have similar problems where they don't have anywhere to go. And that's when you start seeing um, what, at least to amateurs, looks like goofy knight redeployments, where the knight will maybe go to e7 and seek a happier square at f4, or maybe um, even, you know, go all the way back to b8 and seek, um, you know, uh, higher ground at c5. But in this case, uh, Magnus is very pleased with his knight on c6 because the pawn structure changed in such a way already that we have pawns on d4 and b4, which is why you saw the goofy maneuver of the knight going back to, going to e7 and then coming back. So 
Anyways, we have bishop c8, we have this retreating move, preparing just to put that bishop on the correct diagonal. We have d4 hitting the center, we have takes, 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 and bishop e6. So he finishes putting his bishop in the middle, and all of Magnus's pieces are developed, so Magnus should be fine, even though Ian Napomniche's position, as far as an aggressive attacking position goes, looks really great. Um, you, you can't get much better than this. He's got... Uh, more space in the middle of the board, and he's got really good attacking chances. Um, this is my kind of position. I mean, this position is slight edge white all day long, but it's hard to win these positions when you're playing against a, a total machine um, like Magnus Carlsen. So we have pawn to h3, which, I mean, I'll be completely honest, it's, it's a decent move. You, you want to give Luft there. You want to prevent knights and bishops from going to the g4 square. Um, maybe he could have jumped on things a little bit faster. He could have maybe started with the uh, queen c2, queen d3 plan, followed by e5 a little bit quicker. But um, it's just unclear if you want to undergo things like this without making a safety move like h3. So it, it's impossible to fall to h3. Um, c6 and then bishop c2 is, is absolutely correct, putting the bishop on the diagonal where we're going to potentially create an attack against this king, bishop c2, and then we can start lining things up, you know, after e5 or queen d3. We have both of these bishops aiming at the king beautifully. I think on the amateur levels, I think white would win uh, the vast majority of these games. And this is slight edge white, but again, when you're playing against a machine that's always going to find the equalizing move, um, d5, just a perfect move, perfect timing. And in these situations where you're hunkered back like this and you have to defend, it's really, really important to counter strike in the middle of the board and take your fair share of space so that you can simplify and get the pieces off the board. Because if you can't simplify in this position, you are completely lost. So, I mean, if black hangs back for a few more moves. If you just want to hang back and shuffle pieces, your position is going to be lost in, in a matter of moves. Uh, so this is just excellent, totally accurate play. As soon as you can get away with it, you want to strike back in the middle with d5. So we have d5, we have e5 trying to keep things sharp, and then we have dc4, but unfortunately, there's just there's nothing better here. Queens are going to come off the board one way or another. Um, in this position, and they do. And after queens come off the board, we have this uh, uh, set of exchanges. Um, and again, just super accurate move. He doesn't play gf6. He plays bishop b4. Amazingly accurate move. Um, bishop b4 just exchanging off that bishop and just simplifying into an endgame that's just pretty... It's impossible for white to win it. So, I mean, just in a matter of, you know, five, six moves, white went from having a very promising attacking position to all the material being off the board, and we're, we just basically have a position where the position is just dead drawn. Um, there's just nothing going on here, nothing significant um, that White can take advantage of. And um, of course, Magnus just continues to play very accurately. He's got both rooks on open files. That means that White's probably going to have to exchange some rooks too, because Black's rooks are on the most ideal squares. So we have to we have to um, contest those files. We can't play without open files. So we see Ian exchange um, both pairs of rooks, and I mean, it seems illogical. Like, why would we exchange both pairs of rooks? Well, because we need the open files. We can't have Black's rook on open files. So now there's just nothing left. I mean, it's just bishops, and Magnus actually has the slightly more active king in this position. So it's hard for White to even um, dream of getting anything. And at this point, both players know that it's a draw. Nobody can break through. Um, this is a fortress situation where there are actually no entry points for this king. Um, so there's actually no way that white can walk around any direction and make progress because the pawns are covering absolutely any any and every entry point into the position. And there's no way to get rid of these entry points because we have a light squared bishop. So uh, we could attack the c4 pawn, which could be defended, um, but that would be it. And of course, the same thing for black. Black can attack the a4 pawn, which can be defended. So zero progress is being made, but it's a rule that they are not allowed to offer or accept draws before move 40, so both players were required to do a bunch of piece shuffling um, until they hit move 41, which uh, now they can both offer the draw or they can simply claim a draw by repetition, which is what they were going to do anyway. They were going to shuffle back and forth. So this game um, just shows the level of of these two guys. Um, these two guys are just the two best players in the world right now, or two, two of the best players in the world right now. And um, this game 
showed it. I mean, they were just incredibly accurate, both sides. There's really no mistakes to point at. Um, there are a few spots where people have alternatives, but you'll have alternatives in every game. Pretty much zero mistakes, zero errors, zero blunders, zero bad moves from either side. And, you know, when you play chess like this, you know, um, it, it, you know, it draws, um, you know, the expected result. But, I mean, just absolutely amazing chess from both uh, Napomniche and from Magnus Carlsen in Game 3. Um, so game three ended in a draw and we'll just, we'll go ahead and we'll see what happens in games, uh, you know, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, and we'll see what happens in the rest of the match. Well, anyways, uh, thank you very much for watching and I hope you learned something new about chess.